Well, everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We expect that a few more people may trickle in, and we will just work them into the conversation. I'm Betty Kaiser, and I'm here with my colleagues Gay Thomas and Elizabeth Cox, and we're so glad that you're all here. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. We're going to... Um, talk today about engaging hard-to-reach patient stakeholders. We're going to do some very quick introductions, review our workshop agenda, and then get right into discussion questions related to patient stakeholder engagement. You each have a folder with a roadmap for stakeholder engagement that you can use for taking notes throughout the conversation. Yesterday we sent you an electronic version of this document, so if you prefer to work with it on a laptop, please go ahead and do that. I'm a community training specialist with the Wisconsin Network for Research Support, Winners. Winners is a patient and community engagement center based here at the School of Nursing, and Gay and I provide consultation services to researchers who want to engage patient stakeholders in their research. We have five years of experience maintaining several community advisory boards here in Madison. Those boards are the CARDS, the Community Advisors on Research Design and Strategies. And I'm Betty's partner at Winners, Gay Thomas, and we're here this afternoon because of our experience bringing the perspective of patients into the world of research. Um, since 2010, Betty and I figure that we have planned and facilitated about 130 community and uh, patient stakeholder meetings. We've also consulted on stakeholder engagement and training for over a dozen grants, including many ICTER, PCORs, and um, PCORI projects. We are passionate about bringing the powerful voice of lay people into the research process. And last but not least, I'm Elizabeth Cox. I'm a tenured health services researcher in the Department of Pediatrics. I direct an entity called ProKids, which is the program of research on outcomes for kids, and currently have a three-year funded PCORI grant. Also had a, an ICTER cap PCORI pilot, or the first one that was funded. And so I've been sitting in your shoes for many of you out there who are trying to apply for these things. And I, too, am passionate about engaging real world people in how we redesign and deliver health care. Um, we just, we don't need to redesign it for me and probably many of us in this room. There's a lot of other people out there we need to get engaged. I've had the privilege of working with Betty and Gay. They facilitate the patient, uh, or pardon me, parent engagement boards for my project. And I think at this point we've done, on my project individually, 50 uh, stakeholder engagement activities over the last two and a half years. So what we hope to do is really share some of that experience with you today. And we're very interactive and love to take questions. So feel free. So we want to acknowledge our funder for this event, the UW-Madison uh, Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. And this, is, uh, this event is part of a collaboration to create state-of-the-art resources for UW-Madison investigators who are interested in PCOR, patient-centered outcomes research. The programs with, um, five programs with ICTER Community Academic Partnership Program are participating in this collaboration. Um, one of our colleagues, I believe, will be coming back to join us, Sarah Davis from the Center for Patient Partnerships, had to run off, but she'll be back. And um, we'd also like to acknowledge some people who have helped develop the ideas for this workshop, including Dr. Barb Bowers from the School of Nursing, Dr. Gwen Jacobson here uh, at the front table at the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health, and Katie Glass and Catherine Murphy from the Child Life Program at American Family Children Hospital. So we just wanted to start off with um, a couple questions and a show of hands. So how, hello, Elisa. How many of you have um, already participated in some of the lectures or workshops that were part of this ICTER PCOR series? So just raise your hand. All right, All right. well, several people. Mm -hmm. And um, how many of you have experience engaging patients as stakeholders in research? Star and okay. some others. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and um, how many of you have worked already with groups that you would consider hard to reach? Great, Fabulous, great okay, experience. so clearly we have a lot of um, wonderful knowledge and experience already in this room and we hope and expect that there will be a lot of co-learning going on. So um, 
let's take a few minutes at each table to share names and something about ourselves. So we're going to go around the table, say your name, and share the title of one of your favorite movies and a brief reason why that is your favorite. And the three of us will put down our microphones and come join you. All right. So we'll take a cup, just a couple minutes to do this. Well, we want to thank you for humoring us with that. Um, we wanted to start the workshop with this activity because we consider an opening question to be an absolute best practice. When you're working with patient stakeholders, a good opening question gives everyone a chance to share something about themselves. It helps humanize each of us and can help us see past the stereotypes that too often divide us. And over time, opening questions help group members learn more about each other and to feel more connected and comfortable with each other. So let's take a quick look at our goal and agenda for today. We're going to spend most of our time talking about a series of key questions for planning engagement of patient stakeholders and with a special focus on people that we often refer to as hard to reach. All of these key questions are in your roadmap and you'll have a chance to think about them and discuss them at your tables throughout the workshop. The key questions are grounded in our experiences developing and sustaining boards comprised of hard to reach stakeholders. But you can apply the questions and the templates in your roadmap to other patient engagement methods. So if you're planning a focus group with stakeholders or maybe just holding a one-day forum, many of the key questions will be relevant for you. Throughout the workshop, focus on the questions that are most meaningful and most pertinent to you and your project. At 5 o'clock, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then you'll be able to help yourself to snacks right outside the room. And you can feel free to bring, bring snacks back in here. And then in the very last minutes of the workshop, we're going to ask you to take a little, just a few minutes to complete an evaluation. So this is a timeline that Gay and I have seen fairly often when we work with researchers who are brand new to patient stakeholder engagement. And I think we would describe this as a very optimistic timeline. Uh, it really probably does not accurately reflect the realities of engaging patient stakeholders, particularly ones you consider hard to reach. Today we're going to be talking about many of the important details and decisions for you to address before you reach the point of recruiting patient stakeholders and starting to meet. And in our experience, this upstream planning is a key part of effective stakeholder engagement and helps to assure the success and sustainability of your engagement efforts. And if working with patient stakeholders is something new for you, you may want to consider applying for a smaller grant rather than starting with a full PCORI. Elizabeth can speak more to that later. Um, there are many short-term, low-budget grants, such as the ICTER PCOR, that you could apply to to fund your initial stakeholder work. And then when you apply for a larger grant, you already have your stakeholders in place and can start working with them right away. And we've worked with several research teams at the UW who have used this approach. Elizabeth, did you want to make any comment on, on this? Sure. I mean, I think as we get this, this was my plan when I got funded, so I'll just own that right now. Um, <laughs> and then when I met and went and met with Betty and Gay, they went, what? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, and they were absolutely right. So I guess what I would say about it is what's hard is you're a new researcher or a new entity, and you're trying to get money to support something, and, but you don't have money already, and they're expecting you to come in with some sort of evidence of stakeholder engagement. So it's a little bit tricky. My suggestion is two suggestions. One that they already mentioned, which is to apply for some other smaller pots of money to kind of get your stakeholder groups going. And in fact, that's one of the main purposes of the ICTER CAP PCORI is to help people find stakeholders and start to develop relationships with them and have meaningful engagement across a trajectory. There are also several small pots of money that the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute offers. I just applied for one that we're going to gather together stakeholders around the issue of domestic violence and screening for domestic violence in healthcare entities. So hopefully we'll get funded. It's only $15,000, but it's a nice way to get started with your stakeholders. And then lastly, I would really think about um, 
low cost ideas in your community where you can get some initial stakeholder reaction. So one of the things that Gwen and I did on a successful proposal that re we wrote was we reached out to the JDRF, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation here in town, and they actually let us come to a couple of their meetings and just get stakeholder input there. So that way we didn't have to pay anybody, we didn't have to get room, it wasn't as complicated, but we still could evidence that people were highly interested and engaged so that we could then get funding. So I just want to be clear that don't be daunted by the fact that this is not a great way to start with stakeholders. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yep. So we've used this term hard to reach a couple times already um, this afternoon. And uh, we just wanted to take a couple minutes to reflect on that expression or that phrase. So just take a look at those two questions and let's discuss them as a group. So would somebody be willing to share what does that term hard to reach mean to you? Owen. I, mean, I think it's a, a bit of a problematic term Okay, kindred spirit. We're going to try and have you use the mic if you can. Don't be shy. And any any other thoughts about what that means? Yes. And, and, I, can, can we take the mic back to Owen because I I was so busy getting over here that I didn't. I want to make sure that I capture what you said, Owen. Could you could you repeat what you said? Yeah. So I was. <laughs> God has spoken. Yes, thank you. Okay. So I think hard to reach is a problematic um, term in general because it puts the kind of onus on the people that we're trying to reach to be reached when really it's our institutions and our historical legacy of research and excluding folks. Um, that's really the issue. And I think this term actually means like folks of color and low income people and youth and folks with disabilities and people that we haven't traditionally thought of in our institutions. Thank you. And then there was another comment. I think it can um, also be related to the amount of stress and time that these people are under. So, for example, if you are trying to reach patients who are suffering from chronic um, diseases and going through a lot of treatment, they can be hard to reach just because they have a lot of. Any other thoughts, Steve? I take it pretty literally also. I mean, just in terms of how do you connect with these people to get the information that you want back from them. I mean, oftentimes they may be not using some of the traditional media methods or they may not respond because they may not trust those media methods or they Will they only respond to people or organizations that they trust or are familiar with and are not reachable because they don't really respond to people who may have suspicious motives? All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. It's hard to see where you are. So I would take it one step further as far as literally uh, if they're like, farmers living in the netherlands of wisconsin who are all encompassed with their uh, farming tasks then they may have some specific interest that we want to focus on yeah go ahead since we're taking it more in the literal direction uh Pew tries to sample the population, get representative samples of the entire population, and more recently they're getting response rates of about 9%, uh, and they're basically random digit dialing people, and I don't know, maybe we could do a survey of people in the room, but even most of us maybe don't have landlines, and so trying to broaden this even further, I think that it's a very large population that's hard to reach. 
I think we've actually kind of gotten into the second point of why we characterize some people as hard to reach. Um, and I'm sure this is this is really a whole workshop itself that we could we could talk about. But I think what we mainly hope is that today, um, one of the things that you get out of the workshop is that we we help take the hard out of hard to reach, and that we 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 take some of the ownership back to where it belongs with, with us as, as um, in terms of helping us get some concrete ideas and strategies for how to reach and connect with um, people who just typically haven't been involved in the research process. Thanks for all those great responses. That's fantastic. So sort of transitioning from that, PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, how many of you know, already know PCORI? Anybody? No? Sort of? Oh. Yeah, I like that. There's okay. a lot of hand-waving going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually has their own ideas and I think have been responsible for a lot of the sea change for how we think about patient engagement, patient-centered outcomes research, stakeholder engagement, hard-to-reach populations. So I would encourage you, there's a couple of references at the bottom here, just to take a look at what they're really striving for. And I think the first point is about the type of engagement that they're looking for when they go to fund your application. They really want meaningful involvement. So this is, is not, you know, the one-off, I ask two people on the street and this is what I, they're really looking for much more depth than that, much more intensity than that. And they're looking for it throughout the entire research process. And so they actually have an engagement rubric that helps to describe the things that engaged stakeholders could potentially do for you across various stages of research. If you Google PCORI engagement rubric, you'll, you'll get to that. Yep. And if you, this is um, a diagram of just sort of how they think about the stages. So there's the preparatory stage, the execution stage, and the translation stage of research. And they want to see engagement all the way across there. And I'm going to openly admit that when we first sit down to write this, we were looking at what they wanted engaged stakeholders to do and thinking, wow, really? I was not optimistic. But honestly, I can say that when we put it together, we were more thinking that they could react to numbers. So for example, if we put together a table about these are the people who've agreed to participate in our study, these are the people who didn't agree, how could we reach more of these people who didn't agree going forward? Maybe they could do that. But I think what we've ultimately learned is that it, they can do so much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been just mind-blowing what we've been able to get, and I'll just quickly own one of these, too. We had a HIPAA breach early on in our study where we actually incidentally emailed personal health information to 105 kids that we had in our kids. Kids, not just big people, but kids. And our saving grace was that we took the letter that our institution wanted to mail to these families to our parent advisory boards with Betty and Gay, and they basically rewrote the letter. We were terrified that people would say no, they weren't going to participate in our study because we had done this. Um, we ended up meeting 35 of those families directly face-to-face -face in clinic for recruitment. Not one of them ever mentioned it, and 75% of them agreed to participate in the study despite what we had done. And I give the credit back to our stakeholder board who revised that letter. The way it was written institutionally was just scary and off-putting. These people were able to put it in a way that was so much more patient-friendly, parent-friendly. And again, just that was something I would have never imagined that they would save my rear end on. And they've done it many, many times. So I love them. These are other examples. Um, youth, somebody beautifully said youth are hard to reach. They really are. And this is where we had the kids and our stakeholders name our study. So it's called Project ACE. Um, and this is a graphic artist's rendition of that logo that a kid drew. And this is the ultimate product for any of you who haven't seen it. And so my staff wear these, the kids wear these, and it's, it's been a great marketing tactic. All of our um, materials have that on it as well. So helpful to us in that way. So here's where the rubber hits the road. What is this really going to do for me? Get ready. Our recruitment rate for kids exceeds 60% 
In fact, it's probably closer to 70. We're still working on the numbers in different ways. They named the, the project, made the logo, made the, selected the swag that we use. They revised our language for randomization, which I'll talk maybe a little bit more yes. about mm -hmm. later. Um, our survey completion rate six months in with kids 8 to 16 years of age is over 90%. We have less than 1% missing data in the surveys. They helped us to reword, redesign the surveys through this process. They determined the outcomes that we're asking about, which again, they get invested in. They um, helped us to think about follow-up times. So when would they like to be reminded? How would they like to be reminded? What should we say when we remind them? And again, I don't have a randomized control trial to say, well, if I did it a different way, this is you know, what caused this, but I mean, anybody out there knows that a 90% completion rate for surveys is like, what, the last time I told a group that's, people gasped in the room, <laughs> and there were 1,500 of them, um, literally. And then finally, the, we are conducting these intervention sessions where we have kids come in and get in a group and talk about their diabetes care, one time quarterly for a year. Our um, attendance rate at those sessions, both here and in Milwaukee, exceeds 70%, and we are nearly done. We're almost finished. So again, I cannot say enough about the impact of stakeholder engagement. I have my oh, duh moments. What was I as a researcher thinking when I designed this? These kids are absolutely <laughs> right, spot on. So great experience. This is the story about the randomization. I love this story. So when we piloted this study, kids who have type 1 diabetes in their families, many of them really want help. They want, because it is really time consuming and difficult and emotional, and they're young kids. So they're very much looking for help. In our pilot, when we randomized people and we said, oh, well, that's good. You just got in the control group. People were upset. We had people calling their doctors, telling them, could you please get me into the intervention side of the study because otherwise we can't do this. And they were so upset that then the doctors were calling us. Well, we couldn't go forward like this. And so we went to the group, the stakeholder group, and they said, well, that's easy. You just tell them that the computer did it that you guys have no control over where, and it's true, we didn't, but that's what we needed to tell them was the computer did it. And it is absolutely the language that two of the people who recruited for the study who are sitting in the room used. And they also told us that while we think of it as just the control group, that would never be something we could say to a family. Don't use only or unfortunately to describe this, but to really work on explaining why it's so important to be a control. Otherwise, we don't have a study anymore. And so we did that. And then, as you can see, measure of success, our goal was to recruit 200 kids. We recruited 214 kids. I did not have one single phone call to a provider, and we didn't have anybody crying, upset, or trying to get their allocation reassigned. So again, I think nice evidence of how, how well it's working for us. Welcome, Sarah. Come on in. So thanks for those great examples, you Elizabeth. Bet. We want to show you just a very short video with our colleague Barb Bowers. And Barb is reflecting here on her experience with our advisory group here in Madison, the CARDS. I think it's when you are a researcher and you're used to seeing things from that side, it's, and when you've been working on something for a long period of time, it's really impossible to see how clear it is to someone who comes to it cold. I mean. You can pretend to be that person, but you can't be that person. You can never come to it with um, no understanding of the history of something or how it got put together. Plus, you're filling in a lot of blanks because you know the study. You wrote the proposal, so you, you, all the questions have been answered in your head. So it's quite different than, bringing, than someone who doesn't know anything about the study coming to it for the first time. And that's actually the situation that you, you want to simulate because you want to recruit people who this is the first time they've seen it, and is it going to be understandable, and is it going to be offensive? Um, is it going to be interesting? Is it going to pique their interest enough to want to take the time to do it? And I think it's impossible for a researcher to know those things. So, Any, any thoughts, comments, reactions to what Barb had to say there? Yeah, Tracy.
Anyone else? Thank you. Can I just add? A absolutely. So it, I'm also reminded sometimes of my, not just my training as a researcher, but my training as a physician. And so when I'm trying to do work that changes the healthcare system for patients, I simply cannot get my healthcare provider glasses off. I can try, but I just can't. And so I'm not only handicapped from that lens, but also from being a health services researcher as well. It's, it's hard, so definitely valuable. It is hard, thank you, Elizabeth. So let's, um, let's actually start working with your roadmap. You've heard Elizabeth's perspective and a little bit from Barb about the value of working with patient stakeholders. Let's dive into that workbook and take a few minutes to read question number one and its sub-questions. Jot down a few notes if you have any particular ideas and then start talking with the people at your table and share your ideas, share your questions, share, share some of your potential challenges. So go ahead and, and take about 10 minutes for this and then we'll come back together as a group and talk about some of your ideas. Okay, are we ready to share a little bit of our conversation with the whole group? Twee's ready with the microphone here. Is there, is there someone that would like to share just a little bit of what they talked about or uh, burning questions that you have or issues? Sounded like there were some great conversations going on there. Anyone? Yeah, go, please go ahead. So it's it's ironic that you said that because actually the first table that I sat down with, that was exactly the conversation. Does someone over there would you be willing to share what, what you said and, and what we talked about or Anyone else? So I think your point's a really good one, that we don't know, and I, I commented that we were kind of blindsided with ours. We were working very hard along the NIH categories of, you know, what would you look for in this. But then as we talked to those people, we learned about other types or situations in families that we hadn't thought about. And so then we had to kind of go after those or be grateful that we had stumbled on those. In our, our stakeholder recruitment was big enough and broad enough that they then helped us to see where our blind spots were. So I, I think you're absolutely right. When I think at the table that I was talking about, if you're talking about rural um, p drug users, um, you can imagine that there might be some barriers that would prevent them from participating. I mean, I think it, it, it is true that sometimes you don't know who's hard to reach until you try, but I think if you really are specific and think concretely about who you want in your study, some of those barriers pretty much present themselves. And it's just, I think what we're trying to get at is that these are the kinds of decisions that you can think about right now. You know, you can start anticipating those, you can start networking as you guys were even giving each other suggestions at the table for ideas for how you can connect with people to help bring those barriers down or, you know, extend a hand to pull people over and, um, you know, to, to kind of come together. So we are going to now talk about putting together a job description for patient stakeholders. And I just want to start by asking you to think about jobs that you've applied for and to ask yourself, you know, was it important to know what work you were going to do on the job or where the workplace was located? Um, was it important to know how many hours you were going to be asked to work, maybe how much you'd be paid or, or other benefits? And as you can imagine, um, like you, 
Patient stakeholders want to know these details. So those are the kinds of questions that you want to answer before you put together your recruitment material for stakeholders. So go ahead and take a look at question number two in your roadmap, and let's use the same process that we just did. Go through the questions on your own, jot down a few answers, uh, or you know, a few notes, talk about it with people at your table, and then when we debrief it as a group, um, we'd especially like to hear any ideas you have or maybe questions that you have about the work that you want your patient stakeholders to do and how you can describe that work. So let's take about, well, let's take about five minutes to talk about this at our tables. So we can, can we come back together as a group? And when you're thinking about when you're thinking about benefits to stakeholders, there's a broad way to, um, it's, it's, it's more than just uh, you know, dollars and cents, and Elizabeth has some thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, we were talking about this being a job, and so what could we offer people in return for doing this job for us? And again, I had my researcher or physician hat on, and I thought, well, we'll pay them money. Well, we did that. Um, but it was so much more than that. And so I'm going to do the, the second example here. In talking with them, it actually turned out that they very much valued this experience for what it meant in their life for them. And for some of them, it was something that they felt like they could use on a resume as a, a you know, I'm applying for a job. And not just the adults, the parents who were involved, but also the teens who were looking to go on to college or looking for a scholarship or whatever. And so we actually developed this little job description um, for them, and they helped us with the wording for it. And believe it or not, we had to get IRB approval to actually provide it to people. But this is the job description for being a study advisory board member, and people put this on their resume. And then the other thing when you're thinking about this being a job is, well, what sort of certifications might these people need, depending on what you're going to, or what sort of skill sets and, you know, protections, especially if we're doing healthcare. And so one of the things we faced early on is we had thought that we would access our patient and family advisory council at the children's hospital as a way of getting some early stakeholder engagement. But unfortunately, although they really wanted to participate, really wanted to engage, we had some great meetings, they wanted everyone who would be a stakeholder to have a background check. And this was a showstopper for those of us in this group. Because if you can imagine trying to get hard to reach, using that term very loosely, who may not trust you already, and then you're going to start off your relationship with them with, yeah, we're going to get a background check. <laughs> um, and so ultimately, we came to a decision that it was so much more our value that we wanted to include everyone's voices that we were not going to use this as a pathway for getting stakeholder engagement in our study. And I th the other interesting thing was that the other hospital that we work with doesn't require this. And so it was a much easier sell over there to not be doing this. But it, it was an interesting um, conundrum that we were faced with for quite a while. And then finally, do your stakeholders need IRB approval? So depending on what they're going to, do they need IRB certification? Do they need to be listed as part of the research team? And depending on what they are doing or not doing, that may be the case. And so there's a third workshop in this series coming in a couple of weeks, and we're actually going to have someone from the IRB there to talk about those certifications that might be needed as well. Okay. So we're just going to take a, a few more minutes to talk about one more thing before a break. And we wanted to talk um, a little bit about how you would actually use your job description to create some recruitment materials. So if you've, you know, you've actually considered what, what the job is for your patient stakeholders, then you need to transition to recruitment materials to get those people. And the language that you use in those recruitment materials is really important. The right kind of language can feel very inviting to people. Dense or poorly organized language can completely turn people away from your project. And language may be particularly relevant for the stakeholders that you want to recruit to your project. So 
most of us here today are probably familiar with the, the, the term health literacy. How many of you fami are familiar with the term plain language? How many of you have, you have heard that before as a concept? Okay. We want to introduce this idea of plain language and, and think about the differences between these terms. So please take a minute just to read these definitions. And then let's look at these questions. What stands out to you about the differences between these and what misconceptions could people have about these terms? And we're going to go back and, and give you the, the uh, questions so that the definitions so that you can see those. And the questions are up on the board here. What stands out to you about differences and what misconceptions might people have about these terms? Any thoughts? Let's take the first one first, the uh, first question first. What's, what stands out to you about the differences between health literacy and plain language as defined there? I'm having an Owen moment. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Sparks of Wisconsin Health Literacy, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you wondered. <laughs> uh, so other, other thoughts about um, either of these questions? Any, any thoughts? I just want to raise the question that, that you know, harkening back to the earlier conversation about where the burden is, where the onus is, as you said, it, in, the, in these two definitions. Mm -hmm. Do you see any difference there? Well, um, plain language, the onus is on the viewpoint to see it. Um, whether or not So, yeah, which one do you have more control over? One thing that, that we hear, um, you know, is, um, you know, sometimes people will say, well, um, you know, I, I used that, uh, that Flesh Kincaid uh, grade level thing in Microsoft Word, and it said my materials were at an eighth grade level, so I figured that was good. Any, any thoughts about that, about using those, the, the tools that are commonly available in word processing programs. Yeah, Owen. Okay, so before you said that, I actually started to think about what our assumptions are of our audience members. So to use plain language, often I think people would think of like English and a particular use of different terminology. and. I would hope that the assumption, if you're using plain language, is that you think a little bit further about who you're reaching. Um, but these programs that you're talking about, I think, miscontextualize what things mean often. So if you're like trying to use slang or you're trying to use more accessible language for eighth graders, uh, for example, you might be a little out of date or something. You might have a different assumption about what something means is based on what this program says and whoever programmed the program um, versus what the eighth grader would actually read. That, you know, the, the grade level doesn't tell you anything about the actual acceptability of your document to the, to the target population. And any final thoughts on these terms? Yeah. 
Why don't we take a break and we'll come back here, how, how about around uh, 518 or so, about 10 minutes. There are restrooms down the hall. Uh, help yourself to food and feel free to bring it back in. And we'll talk a little bit more about plain language when we come back. All right, let's go ahead and finish our discussion about plain language. We wanted to, so we, we just finished right before the break talking about the idea of health literacy versus plain language. And several people made the point that, that plain language is, is something, uh, is a responsibility that we can assume rather than, um, rather than, um, complaining about the health literacy level of the people that we're trying to reach, we can take the responsibility for using plain language in our outreach materials. So we wanted to share just a few plain language guidelines here, and you can take a quick, list, take a quick look at this list. And then to put those into practice, um, in your roadmap, can you look at Appendix 1, the job description template? And um, and let's just just take a look at that and and look, consider it in light of those guidelines up there. And so can can people maybe offer some comments about you know how they they think this template fits with those guidelines or um, where maybe it's falling a little short? What do you think? Any any thoughts about this the job description template and how it matches the guidelines? It's shorter than a lot of the PVLs I've seen recently. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> and we did develop this as an alternative to um, some materials that we've seen that are you know that are very dense with text. You know, a lot of words, um, and you know, something that could be daunting uh, for a prospective patient stakeholder. So this is this is an attempt to. Uh, incorporate some plain language guidelines. And or anything that, Steve, it looks like you have something. I have comment, yes. So I have found that within the university <laughs> system, is jargon is rampant. <laughs> and even, you know, when you're dealing with people who have lower literacy or lower health literacy, they tend to take things very literally. So you know, I'm, I'm just looking at this and saying, okay, to assume that they know what you're talking about when you say research, hmm. you know, to, to some of those folks, research would be something they had to do in high school for a term paper. Mm -hmm. You know, so to, to, they wouldn't necessarily even understand what you're trying to do with this. So, I mean, it's just something to be aware of, and there are sometimes you have to really define your terms mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they really understand. And the other thing I wanted to just comment on was your first point here, that when you find plain language ways to say things, it's not unusual for it to actually have to use more words because you're defining something in the process. So, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned it's more important that you do these other things, the short sentences and all mm -hmm. those kinds of things. That's a good point. That, that, that exactly that. matches our experience that w in working with our uh, boards of community advisors when they have, you know, when they look at re materials that researchers bring, the, um, their recommendations often involve, not often, but sometimes involve actually using more words, but the final result is more straightforward.
different information seeking needs? How do we go about creating stuff that's flexible? Was that a question, Zahar? <laughs> well, I, I'm thinking about the several things that have been said. I think that um, one thing is to recognize that one, one piece of paper um, doesn't solve all of your problems and that often, you know, to provide that extra context, it takes a real person. And so, you know, this is a, this is a tool for recruiting stakeholders. It's not the recruitment process. And so, you know, being able to fine tune your recruitment uh, pitch, you know, to different kinds of stakeholders and really, you know, to tailor it as much as possible, you know, is something that we would recommend. You, you need to, you know, you can't create an individual piece of, you know, recruitment material for every, you know, 12 stakeholders or 24 that you want to recruit. But if you have something that's sound to start with, you know, that, that p supplies the information in a straightforward way as possible, then you can provide more information in a one-on-one -on -one context. And we would st strongly recommend that with, with hard-to-reach populations. The, the personal touch really matters to people. You want to say? Yeah, I guess I would just say that's exactly our experience. We had something that wasn't very plain language as a recruitment tool, and these ladies helped us to put that in a very similar to the format you have in front of you. But it really came down to a personal conversation, and it, it also came down to physicians actually putting this in the hands of families that they thought would be ideal for serving because they had that trusted relationship with the family where when we were just mailing these out sort of cold, we weren't getting much response. So I think the personal relationship, and then people would call us or we would call them, and it was... In a way, it was kind of like speed dating, according to one of my 16-year-old advisors. She, she actually said that in front of 1,500 people, that it was like speed dating. And so there were things she wanted to know about us, and there were things that we sort of wanted to know about her. And so it was her opportunity to tailor that conversation to her needs. So I think you're right. We can't do it in one piece of paper. You, oh, wait, yeah, Nan. Can you talk about your We, we have quite a bit we could say about that. Is is there something specific that you're that you're thinking about? It's all pros. Yes, that's what I would. The, the bottom line to me is there's no con. <laughs> if you are asking people to give their time and their expertise um, to participate, you pay them. That's it, it, to me. It's unethical not to honestly, and and we hear this not not. I'm looking at Elizabeth. Just I know she hears no. this. <laughs> yeah. That people say, oh gosh, I I'm on a lot of boards. You know, I mean, I I volunteer here, there. I do this stuff, and um, I don't expect to be paid. And um, I, you know, I, I that's I we understand that a lot of people do that. I mean, we do that too in a professional capacity. That's what you know. That's what we do. What we do. But when you're asking people to to give up their personal time in the form of a job to come and take it as seriously as you want them to, it's really important to, to pay people. We think of Elizabeth actually as kind of a model for for what because of the way you did it. That, well, why don't you talk about your compensation? So. I might not be the person to exactly talk about this, but I think we pay people $100 per, um, they're there about an hour and a half to two hours. We have had the experience in studies that we've run, not in this particular one, but in other studies where we've paid people for participation, where they have torn up the check and attached the fragments to the survey or whatever it was that we did, or left a note in it that said, oh, no, 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 you don't need to pay us, you know, and then we had no way to really get it back to them. People are so very generous of their time, um, but I agree with what we're all saying, that this is a job and we want people to take this seriously, and so we have consistent attendance at these meetings that exceeds like 90%. It, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And, we had a kid say um, so cutely to a large audience one time, he said, initially I came because of the money, but now I come because I can make a difference. And literally he's 11 and he's like batting his eyelashes. And, but you, you know that he's speaking the truth about he likes the money, but 
He really is there because he can make a difference. Yeah. So that's been my experience with paying people. And your boards meet every about every four months every or four so. Months. Yep. You know, our our standing boards that we've had for five years here in Madison meet every month, and we we pay those members thirty five dollars for a ninety minute meeting. And we cover child care and transportation if that's needed, and provide food at the meeting as well. And I guess just to add one more thing to that, PCORI, the funder that actually is funding our work, requires that we pay everybody equally. So we have a blended board that has physicians, nurse practitioners, others. So then you're at that situation where you have to pay everyone at this gathering equally, and that's kind of where we got to the $100 scenario that we're at. Um, do you guys want to say anything about um, means testing and people receiving money? Well, you know, we do... At UW, um, you know, we just keep careful track of the money that we pay out for, um, you know, for stipends every month. I mean, you know, we just, you know, there's a threshold, the magical $600 threshold uh, above which you need to collect Social Security numbers. You know, Social Security numbers is just, it's, it's another one of those hot button things like a background check. If you tell, you know, some people that you're going to need Social Security numbers, that's just going to be a no-go uh, for some of the people that you may want to have as stakeholders. So actually thinking about that, how often you're meeting is mm -hmm. a big factor because you, we didn't want to bump up against the $600. We actually pay people in cash. Um, and we've had people tell us that they that's really important for a couple reasons. One thing is if you don't have a checking account, you know, $35 isn't $35 to me if I have to go pay a fee to cash it. You know, it's, it's already worth less. And um, little amounts of money can actually make a difference in then people's benefits, el eligibility for other benefits. And that's a whole complicated world that, you know, changes all the time. And we're not experts on that. We don't want to be experts on that. We don't want to get involved in that. We don't want to get people in trouble with that. So we just give them the cash, what they do with it, how they record it, you know, that's that's out of our our hands and it's much nicer that way I, I think sarah had a comment first and then over here yeah i don't want to take us down the, the reimbursement rabbit hole if it's not helpful but and it's so, so i can get your permits online, online but, but um i've, I've been, been told, told as, as i'm trying, trying to figure this all out, out that for the, for the, the child, child care and the transportation that can't, can't be done in the cash that, that has to be done well, we don't even do it that way. We actually work with a community partner so that our community partner takes care of all the transportation and child care. We, because, again, we're not licensed child care providers. We didn't want to get into that. Um, we don't have a standing contract with Green Cab. Um, so we, we work with our centers, and the centers take care of all that for us. So it's out, you know, we don't. We don't have to worry well, about that. Well, and just, just to finish that thought, you know, part of thinking about fair compensation is fair compensation for your community partners. So it's not just a matter of, re, you know, compensating your patient stakeholders, but, you know, it's the, the center has to, you know, come up with the, the money to provide the cabs and to take care of the child care. And so we also pay our community partners a monthly facility fee to en encompass, um, you know, their work in, in getting the facility ready, child care and transportation. So that, that's, you know, when you're thinking about compensation, the, the, the patient partner compensation is part of a bigger package. Which is actually a really nice segue to our next slide. Mm -hmm. Uh, which ha has to do with how you're going to recruit patient partners. And in just a minute, we're going to be thinking a little bit more about this. Um, and it's already been raised that one important uh, um, consideration is that having clinic or community partners can be enormously helpful. Um, so we're just going to show a short video, actually two short videos, to give you a few ideas about recruitment partners. The first is Janet House, who was a community organizer with the Leisure um, Community Education Center. And Janet helped uh, Betty and me recruit for our community advisory boards the cards, um, well, it was the fall of 2010. So being in the community, um I, do, I did a lot of door knocking. I did a lot of connecting the people together. Like if I approach your building and your neighbor didn't know you, I'll introduce you guys. And the conversation starts from there. You know, um, it's, I have an internal connection. I just figured that out yesterday. 
so when they approached you approached me about cars, I was like, sure, I can recruit Denise, Royce, I mean, uh, you know, whoever. And they came and they participated. And like Charlie was saying earlier, that's just a natural way of doing things. We have a um, form for researchers to use when approaching community organizations, and you have it as appendix number two, and we're going to talk about that in, in a few minutes. But um, we developed this with our community partners so that it reflects the information that they told us that they wanted to see, um, that they, hopefully they would actually like to see this before somebody calls them, cold calls them, that, that somebody has sent them this so they know who's calling and, and why. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, we're going to go on next to a short video um, with some members of Elizabeth's teen advisory board, and um, they're talking a little bit about the role that physicians can play in recruitment. How were you actually recruited? Was it just your doctor, or what did your doctor give to you? How did you follow up, all of that? Um, she mentioned it to me, and then I received a call um, explaining what it was, and then went through an interview process, and then they decided from there, um, like, who was on it. From there, so. And do you think that's a good way to recruit teenagers? Um, I think that it's fine. Um, I wish I heard a little bit more of it from my doctor, because I had this person call me, and I didn't really <laughs> know who it was until they, you know, kind of explained it more, so I would have liked for my doctor to explain more about it before being called about it. <coughs> Do you remember um, how you were recruited, or was it really just through your mom? She heard about yeah, it. Yeah, I think know. my mom, um, I think someone emailed her about the opportunity, and then she um, forwarded it on to me. So I think that's how we heard. And do you think that was an effective way? Can you think of any other ways that researchers could recruit teens if they, if they wanted teenagers as part of their um, research team? Um, I think that probably the best way would be through maybe like their appointments, having their doctors talk to them about it and talk up why it's important to have people in their research projects. So maybe like someone could pass it on to their doctors. So are there any quick comments or reactions to those videos? Any thoughts or? Actually, I think it's the first time Elizabeth has seen um, the teens talking ab about their recruitment. I, I wonder if you have any comments, Elizabeth, about what they had to say about physicians. It was a lot harder to recruit teenagers than I, I mean, I imagined it would be hard, but it was a lot harder than I thought it would be. I think the physicians were really a critical link in the um, process. And I probably cringe as a pediatrician at the idea of having a mom recruit her daughter. I didn't know that it went down that way, um, and I'm not sure how it did, but obviously I would probably prefer to go to the kid first. But things happen for, I guess, a reason. They're part of our group and have been for two and a half years. But, wonderful. yeah, the doctors were fantastic about helping us. Any, any other comments on those videos? Yeah. So, part of what I see is responding to that really, where you can participate so we would need all of the stakeholders and other stakeholders. Is that it? In your years, like there's one person and then you rely on that person to access that people. But with all of these teams, it seems like I'm assuming that it's that. So I think this comes back to the timeline that they showed at the beginning. We literally left ourselves no time when we got funded. And in addition to that, the funder has this process of executing a contract. So you find out that you got funded, but then it's like six to eight weeks later, but yet your, your clock has already started on your project, and we were also up against the holidays. Um, when we found out. So we were very compressed, but I think that's a fabulous idea to use a snowball sort of methodology where someone knows someone. I don't know, Owen, if you've thought about that for your project. You guys were talking about it. Yeah. It's, it's a commonly used methodology for recruiting. I think it's a great idea. And I think you're right. We would have. The other thing we were doing was purposely trying to recruit specific types of people, so ages, genders, you know. So we were doing maximal variance sampling as well, which that would get hard. You'd have to say no to people. Um, well, you know, we've got enough boys or, or whatever the case may be. But yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, we want to get back to that um, 
that contact form, Appendix 2, in your packet and, and talk a little bit about this idea of reaching out to community partners. Has anyone here worked with a community partner on a project, know a community partner that you're considering working with on a project and particularly, you know, in terms of seeking some help for recruiting your stakeholders? And I saw a couple people nodding. So let's, I, I think Owen uh, nodded first there, Twee. Yes, please. And we want, we'd like to hear some examples about, about community partnerships. And we, we just want to talk about this because we think it's such a critical part of reaching hard-to-reach stakeholders, to have, to have contact with trusted people in the community who know your stakeholders is invaluable. We had one over here. This is a previous project that I did when I was in the back of the DC. But I, uh, we were recruiting, we needed to interview and do stuff that was just with people that were connecting with us. Um, and I had a couple of community groups there. One is FANDU, which is we basically, like, they describe it as a union for drug users that have been on the street. Um, and we first met with them back and we do a lot of community meetings and showing our face, meeting with the residents and um, talking with them afterwards. And then that's how we got into talking with them and they were really helpful with, you know, saying these people would like to interview people who are using drugs and what the safety injection site means to them. Any more examples? That Just two things I wanted to point out about the form. One is just that the, the form itself, um, as I mentioned earlier, our community partners have said that they often get, and you can imagine, they get calls from researchers, um, hey, uh, you know, I've got this great study, can I come recruit? Or, you know, can I come do something? Or just out of the blue, they'll get an email with an attachment of a flyer that I guess, you know, they're supposed to print out and, and start posting places. Um, and what this, this form really is intended to both help you and to help the community center, to just make that whole process a lot more efficient and streamlined, to give the community centers the, the information so they know who to direct you to, you know, which staff member is the right person to, to handle this, and to give, give them a sense of what it is that, they're, that you're actually asking of them. On the top of the second page, the what are the possible benefits, that's another really important thing to think about because I think often as researchers we think, well, we're offering a community good, and so shouldn't a community center or we're offering a clinic good, shouldn't a clinic want to, to offer this? But nobody is sitting around, as you, I'm sure none of you are, with extra time and resources on their hands just waiting, you know, to help you with your project. So to think really creatively about what you can do. Financially, you can, you know, is there an actual stipend that you can write in, like the facility fee that Betty mentioned earlier? Is there a way that you can donate 
some goods or services? Can you run a book drive? Can you, you know, what is there something that the the the, the organization could use that you could could help them with? They they um, always need volunteers for events. So they do um, collaborating on grant writing, offering to come and give a presentation, just to think outside the box. There's so many things: subscriptions to magazines, books. I mean, there's so many things that that are ways that you can give back and really demonstrate that that you understand that this is a reciprocal relationship and it isn't just a, a, a taking. Okay, we're going to switch gears now and, and talk about question four in your roadmap. What skills and knowledge will your stakeholders need to effectively and confidently do your work? We think it's really important to be intentional about preparing your patient stakeholders. We've encountered a really wide spectrum of attitudes about the idea of orienting and preparing patient stakeholders, and sometimes researchers may feel that stakeholders don't need any special preparation. So I, I guess I wasn't totally in that camp that they don't need any preparation, but I think I was also a little bit nervous about if we prepare them too much, when do they become looking like researchers as well? So a delicate line there between the two, but definitely an orientation to the job we're going to ask them to do and some of the skills that they're going to need to have. And the main thing here is to, you know, prepare people for the work that they will do. You know, sometimes there's, you know, there's this idea that, well, either we don't need to prepare them at all because I'm just asking people for advice and everybody knows how to do that. And then there's also, you know, another extreme of I've got to tell people about human subjects and the IRB and the research process and data collection and data analysis. And, you know, you really want a happy medium in the middle there, a, a, an orientation, an interactive orientation that prepares people for their work. So when Gay and I design and lead orientations, we're focused on three things and three things only. We want stakeholders to understand the respons their responsibilities in the project. We want them to feel confident that they can do this work. And we want them to feel like they're respected members of a community. We want people to leave the orientation feeling very positive. They know what their work will involve. They know they can do it. And they feel like they're part of a community wh where they'll be treated well. We're going to show you just a brief video here with a member of our, one of our advisory boards. I mean, you talk to people, convince them to come see us as ordinary people. You know, while our opinions count based on training that we acquired from you and the, the understanding that I had all along from day one as to what this is for, it's amazing. I, I can never, I mean, I could be as busy as anything in the world, but I will create time to come back again and again. I mean, there's amazing people. I mean, Rizaki is like family to me. I mean, and everyone in the group. I mean, they speak, I listen. And I learn every day I come in here. My opinion counts, and I believe that. So that was a member of our East Side uh, Community Advisory Board here in Madison. We also just wanted to share, oops, going too fast here. We also wanted to share a few comments from um, Elizabeth's advisory, parent advisory board in Milwaukee. We just recently talked with them about what they remembered about their orientation, which is almost two years ago now. And you know, now that they've been advising uh, on Elizabeth's project for several years, you know, what, what do they think about that orientation? And we just want to share a few things that they said. I think the most helpful part of the, or, of the orientation was the practice giving feedback on research materials. I feel it pulled the group together as a team and prepared us for the upcoming meetings. I think the orientation prepared me quite well for the parent advisory board. I didn't realize how much I needed it then, but it really prepared me for our work. And then finally, at the orientation, talking about and agreeing on ground rules made us a team. So we have developed our Project ACE team 
developed a resource for orientation, and we call this Topper, the Toolkit on Patient Partner Engagement in Research. This is a free online resource that you can use and adapt for patient partner orientations. This is a complete set of orientation materials for adult stakeholders. It includes a step-by-step -step manual for facilitators and 20 supplementary worksheets and templates. We've listed a few of the materials here. They include skits, case studies, and some handouts and you can download load this entire toolkit at this website and we brought a copy uh, of the um, of topper that you can browse um, when the workshops over at six o'clock if you like we wanted to show you this this is from the youth advisory board training in Elizabeth's project Topper, the, the toolkit that we just um, showed you was developed for adults, but you can adapt it for other target audiences. And so here, our child life partners have adapted one of the activities from Topper for a youth audience. And this slide displays a photo from the youth orientation. And the, the facilitators, they adapted a group norm setting activity that we had done with adults. And here, this, the, you can see this, um, the kids generated their own group rules on a flip chart. So this was the first time that all of these kids had been together. They generated their own group rules on a flip chart. And then each kid walked up to the front of the room and signed the chart. And so this process you know, promotes accountability. Um, the kids developed their own rules, and they committed to following them. And uh, Gwen or Elizabeth, how old, the, this was the not the teen group, but the youth group that did that. And how old are those kids? Eight to twelve. So we hope that you know when you're when you're browsing, we hope that you do download Topper um, at the, that website and think about how you can adapt those materials. We really do want people to think about how they can apply to um, an orientation for your partners, your um, patient stakeholders. Yeah. All right. Can you? So um, we're going to talk very briefly about budgeting for um, stakeholder engagement. This slide shows um, some major categories of expenses related to stakeholder engagement. Um, engaging hard to reach patient stakeholders definitely requires some special attention to overcoming barriers, some of them that we've talked about, like ch transportation and child care. It also re it requires a significant investment in project team personnel and in partners who can, can help you. And as uh, Elizabeth mentioned earlier, you know, the budgeting is a, is a balancing act. You want to prepare a budget that matches the scope of um, stakeholder engagement in a realistic way and the stakeholder engagement that you propose, but you also want to propose something that, that actually has a chance of being funded. Um, there's no magic formula to that, that balance. We just say maybe you can talk with researchers like Elizabeth who've had grants with stakeholder engagement or you can talk with us at Winners and we're happy to review your grant application and give you feedback on your plans and, and budget. And you might be able to get some advice from a um, program officer as well. At the back of your road map, map in Appendix 5, you have a budget template for patient stakeholder engagement. Um, so if everybody sees that, it's, it's um, two pages, I think. Um, the template is organized into three categories, uh, recruitment of stakeholders, orientation, and ongoing meetings. And within the categories, we've listed just a variety of possible expenses. And in the right column, we've put down some questions just to help you think about the budgeting. And um, we want to point out that the purpose of all of this information and the questions is not to overwhelm you. <laughs> Although I know when we, we looked at it at first, we were like, oh my gosh, th this looks like so much to think about. But we actually hope that the questions will just help stimulate your thought and help you kind of chunk down the decisions into realistic, um, dis in, you know, realistic pieces that will help you design an effective plan for stakeholder engagement. You know, we just have seven minutes left. Should we open up for qu some questions? Let's. What are we missing here at the end? The, the sustaining the involvement? Do you want to mm -hmm. just do that for two minutes? Or? Yeah, we, we, we want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So um, We, we did start 10 minutes late. We just want to point out. <laughs> so 
yeah. I don't know. We're, we're not that inefficient. Um, <laughs> we just want to um, quickly talk about sustaining the involvement of your stakeholders. When, when Gay and I talk with people about having sustained our community advisory boards for more than five years now, you know, people drop their jaws. You know, they, you know how, how is it that you've been able to, to sustain the involvement of those stakeholders that long? And, you know, the answer is that it's, it's conscious practices that do it. It's not just luck, it's, it's conscious practices. And um, there are specific strategies that, that you can follow, and you'll see some of those in your roadmap, some specific strategies that we recommend. And we want to give you just a couple of examples on, the, on this. Creating personal connections. We really recommend that on your project you have a designated staff person who's really going to be your regular coordinator for these kind of activities. On Project ACE, you know, everybody knew that Gwen was they're the contact person. That's where you go. Um, and it's really hard for stakeholders to trust your team and to develop relationships when they're just not sure who they're supposed to call for what or when there's sort of a rotating uh, group of people in and out. We know that it can be tempting, um, you know, from a budget standpoint to plug graduate students in to these roles and just to think, well, when I lose, when I lose Amy next year, then, you know, Todd will step in. But that kind of inconsistency is actually, um, you know, defeats what you're trying to build with stakeholders. So here's a quote from one of our community advisors about the importance of consistency. You trust somebody, you learn to open up to that person. People changing, new faces coming, the comfort level is not there. You have to trust somebody to be able to communicate very well with them. And uh, just an exa um, sharing examples of the impact of stakeholder input, Elizabeth and Gwen have seen this firsthand. If your stakeholders provide feedback to you, it's very important to close the loop and come back to them and tell, give them an explicit example of how their input changed your project. What change did you make because of the input that they provided? So if they provide feedback on a survey, show them the final version of the, sh of the survey. Show them how, that how, you ch how you changed it based on their feedback. If they give you strategies that help you to retain participants, report back to them with some retention data and explain how they made a difference. In Project ACE, we take some time at every meeting, in fact we have a meeting coming up on Sunday, to explain how the research team used advisory board input to improve the project. And this is, this is closing the feedback loop and stakeholders have told us over and over again how affirming this is. This is the payoff for stakeholders. The compensation matters, but this is what people want. They want to know they've made a difference. We want to just say a little something about acknowledging the, the contributions. Um, we send stakeholders personal notes to thank them for coming to meetings. Um, everyone brings something unique and special to a, to a group, whether it's you know, how they show respect for others or a good sense of humor, um, a good idea they offered, or, or maybe just great listening skills that really help the meeting go well. Uh, and stakeholders tell us, again, you know, over and over, how meaningful it is for them to get these personal notes. And they do mention those as a a, a reason they come back to meetings. We don't do it after every meeting, of course, because that you know, it's it that would probably be a little too much. But just or we'll we'll do it if somebody really did a, something incredibly outstanding at a meeting that really you know um, stood out to us as as something you know we really wanted to lift up. And then finally, we just want to say, don't be shy about addressing problem issues. Things don't always go well. You know, there might be um, stakeholders that aren't participating effectively. You may find that. Um, the meeting agenda was designed poorly or the meeting dynamics just, just weren't right. Don't ignore those. They're not going to get better on their own. I'm sure most of us know that if any one of us has ever been in a relationship. I think, you know, you know in general things just, <laughs> time does not heal all as it turns out. Um, 
And a practice that we recommend is debriefing with your research team after every meeting and talking about what went well, maybe what could go better next time, and then discussing some specific ideas and strategies for making changes and improvements the next time around. And the other thing we just want to mention is if it, if it turns out you do have to meet directly with a stakeholder to um, address an issue, as, as we have, um, to really try to frame that discussion as an opportunity to reaffirm your mutual commitment to each other, your mutual um, expectations of one another, and always to try to create you know win-win um, scenarios. And I'm sure most of you would do that naturally, but just to make it an intentional practice, uh, we found makes a big difference. So I think um, well, we just we, want to remind you. One more. My turn. So this is the last in this series of three workshops. We're actually going to be talking about sustaining engagement over the long haul in a project and pulling together boards that have different types of stakeholders in them. So for example, uh, parents and kids, or physicians and patients, or similar sorts of things like that. So this is another um, evening workshop on March like 8th, I think. OK. Oh, uh, one more thing. Please fill out the surveys. We get evaluated based on what you tell them. If we don't collect data, we are suspect. <laughs> We're missing our hard to reach them. <laughs> so please fill out the survey. There are several um, people around to help you. And it really will just take two minutes. It's just like 13 questions. So thank you all so much for coming. We have this room reserved until 7 o'clock. And we will be here. So p please feel free to help yourself to more snacks. Sit around and chat with each other. We're here to, to talk with you and answer any questions that you might have and it's been a real pleasure to um, to hear what you've all had to say today so thank you for thank you for your contributions yes thank you so much